Welcome back to Finals Day, the HS Arena Invitational with me, Calvin Saul, bringing you this next game. It's going to be Arnie versus Sixon. And we said before the break that these guys uh, have been really looking forward to playing each other. There was a little bit of trash talk going back and forth in the, the players' chat before the tournament. Uh, these guys actually played uh, a pickup game just before the tournament just to, I don't know, test out against each other, kind of test their metal against each other. Um, Sixo thinks he's going to get this one over with pretty quickly. They're uh, both kind of both very feisty players. We know each other quite well, and this should be an entertaining clash. Yeah, absolutely. Two of the most, um, should we say, abrasive, emotional, uh, reactive players. Polarizing. In, in, yeah, polarizing is a good word. Um, Thank various you. adjectives that we could throw around to uh, describe the personalities of these two players. But no great surprise that these were the two to clash in the player chat, and there was a few words thrown around, it was settled uh, in, in the right way, in the typical esports fashion, where it's like, all right, let's play it Fight out. Fight me 1v1. Yeah, let's play it out, scrub. Like, come on, take it to the game. Um, should, we, should we spoil for them who won that warm-up match, Callum? Well, uh, Sixo did win that warm-up match 3-0 uh, with the class that RDU has now banned. So <laughs> that just goes to show maybe RDU got a little bit of information out there about what he didn't want to face. So, uh, yeah, RDU banning out the patron of 6 0, which managed to 3 0 him. We saw that patron warrior get some work done yesterday as well. Uh, as you see the class lineups here Druid, Warlock, and Mage for RDU with Warrior banned and Mage, Hunter, and Druid for 6 0. So, I believe it's the uh, Aggro Druid on both sides, Handlock, and Freeze Mage on both sides? Freeze Mage on both sides, yep. Yeah, and then the Handlock and the Hunter. So, that's kind of an interesting. Uh, double mirror there with the two decks and then obviously the war the handlock versus the hunter which uh that's a matchup which does divide opinion yeah i mean just just bands wise it's no great surprise that um at least six o banned out what he knows is control warrior just because he has a face hunter and a freeze mage in his lineup so like no great surprise that the warrior is gonna gonna two, bite the two of the worst matchups against control Warrior. yeah two pretty horrible match i mean face hunter can can do things there was a time um, just before the TGT meta, where people were starting to figure out that matchup a lot more with Face Hunter, but then Justicar appeared and ruined everything. So, and Bash as well, and, and Bash, just all yeah. the other options. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no great surprises on the bans. Um, and again, RDU's ban seems to be motivated by the uh, the three three zero clubbing he received in the warm up match. I mean, I, I don't blame anyone for banning that deck against Six. So just purely because you haven't figured out how to play against it yet. Right. It's, how it's, do you know how to counter it? Yeah, it's the unknown factor. There's only a couple of people who are really messing around with that list, or at least messing around with it successfully. Um, 6-0 was very, very high ranked with it for a while. He fell off afterwards and didn't manage to maintain that level of success with the deck, but he definitely at least feels comfortable enough to bring it here, and he's done very, very well with it yesterday. You know, we even saw him pushing through decks that um, the regular old-school patron warrior struggles against, like Handlock. So. Yeah, Handlock and, and Priest were the two classes he got wins against uh was it Gara you played against? With I think it was classes? Gara, yeah. Uh, did very well with, with that deck. Uh, but he's not going to have that available to him. Instead, he's going to have the Face Hunter, the Freeze Mage, and the Aggro Druid. Uh, interesting, two aggressive decks from 6 and one control, and two control and uh, one aggro from RDU. Aggro Druid's another deck we've seen getting some work done. We've seen uh, quite a few players bring it to this tournament. Raven did very well with it on day one, and of course RDU and 6 both piloting it uh, to this quarterfinal stage. Yeah, it's interesting. I think it's a deck that... Um... When Kirst came up with it, he wanted something basically that was was too aggressive for Paladin and had um, a lot of options. You know, Darnassus Aspirant is good to compete early against things like Minibot. You have Swipe to control tokens, and you just have a ton of damage to be able to like race the game out and end and, and clutch it out before their big power turns come down late. Um, so not a big surprise to see it having a big impact in this tournament, where we have also seen Paladin being one of the, the big talking points, the big power decks. So um, the face Druid, definitely effective against that. All right, well, we see the face hunter of six, or not the face druid, it's the face hunter to start with against the handlock of RDU. RDU, uh, very strong handlock player. Handlock is, I think, probably his RDU's favorite deck. He uh, constantly talks about it from what I hear from other pros. Uh, he loves playing the deck. It's a deck that he will bring pretty much every time he's bringing Warlock in his lineup. You can pretty much guarantee that it's handlock. Is this matchup as simple as kill the handlock before he plays double molten giant taunt? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, um, Face Hunter isn't a deck that can build a board and hold like a lot of decks can do against Handlock. Like you just you just get an imposing board, you leave them at that sort of awkward sixteen-ish health, um, where Molten Giants don't really have an impact, so they can't be comboed with anything. Um, they really do have to just throw their damage because their minions aren't sticky. They don't hold on the board. They just deal their damage once and get out. That's primarily what you know. If every one of your cards in your deck gets its damage in. 
then you feel like you have a good chance of winning the game against most decks. Um, but yeah, Handlock has a has a really good opportunity to crush that out. Um, so honestly, a lot of the time as the face hunter player, you're just going all in and just taking the the standard stance as the aggro player, which is just make them have it. If you don't, I'm gonna punish you really, really hard. Yeah, we do see he does have one molten giant and a taunt giver, so uh, it's <laughs> a double huffer rolls from six. So do you know what helps you get in that job done? Double huffer. That's a pretty good starting point for racing down the opponent. Turn three, his opponent is at 13 life. This can, I mean, this can happen with Face Hunter. Warlock can, st obviously, if you can stabilize his handlock, you can just uh, really control this matchup. But you can also just lose it on turn five or six. Yeah, this is uh, definitely one of the ways you can clutch this out. Because if you're able to do it efficiently enough in enough turns, um, then because you have so many turns left over, each turn you have left over if you've done the damage this quickly is one extra turn that you get to press hero power which is damage that you can always commit through something like a Molten Giant and a Taunt. Um, so if you limit the amount of turns the Handlock gets to stay alive, you limit the amount of draws they get towards their Molten Giants, towards their Taunts, and then even if they do get that onto the board, you're limiting the amount of draws they get to the other thing they need, which is the Antique Kill Ball. Here we go with the Molten Giant and the Watcher as well. So double Taunts for the Warlock. And uh, this is where you, if you're sick, so you hope you've put the card Hunter's Mark in your deck. But other than that, yeah, Hunter's Mark or Iron Bee Cow. Um, Iron Bee Cow generally slightly more common in, in Face Hunter. Um, but he has two damage on the board guaranteed with the Lethanome Death Rattle. He has a Hero Power again, so his opponent is at seven this turn. So he's going to need a minimum of four more turns. Um, he can be expected to draw some sort of over the top burn in that time as well. Um, which means that he, he uh, actually buys himself a lot of time as well by just clearing out the Molten Giant. But there is a lower Theb in his opponent's hand that can be played a, a key point to try and lock out the uh, the crucial turn where he could die to to kill command. The snake trap in uh, Sixo's hand could also be pretty important here if he draws into something like a kill command. If he's able to play the snake trap beforehand and RDU does trigger mm -hmm. it and leave one of the snakes up, it's going to give him that extra push with the kill command. So RDU does need to be careful of basically every card that Sixo can play at this point. I have no time for yeah, this. absolutely. But basically what this comes down to is either um, trying to set up a lethal as the handlock player um, before your opponent is able to put together those few damage turns that he needs or buying enough turns, trying to sneak a tap in if you feel that you can, which he probably doesn't in this situation, trying to find anti kill bot, which is the other option. But like I said, lower Theb is going to be a really good option this turn. Because um, it just hard locks out the kill command this turn and allows him to just push through and set up lethal um, if that trap is not explosive, which we know it isn't. So yeah, even kill com yeah. This is a, this is the bluff actually. This is what's really interesting is that attacking here into the explosive trap that sets you up for a potential uh, quick shot draw for lethal from six zero. I don't think it matters. Um what your read is i think you have to attack this turn because it's your only route to victory in this game i don't think if you don't attack this turn i don't think you can set up lethal then even if your lower third does block a kill command this turn you still just die to it next turn um so you need to if you're going to lock out the kill command this turn you need to set up the the play to give your opponent only one more turn to get the kill you have to play the lower this turn right if you don't you also put yourself on kill on quick shot Right. Um, so he, was, he was toying around with the big game hunter there. Yeah, I mean, we're biased here because we can see the kill command. RDU is, of course, um, dealing with the full range of options, whereas, you know, right now, for example, Wolf Rider kills him, Arcane Golem kills him, because there's only yeah. one taunt in play, so just bash that down with the weapon, charge the minion through the face, and press hero power. So it's not like there was... There we go. Um, <laughs> Arjun Horse Rider does not kill him. If that card was a Wolf Rider, if we if we fully embraced the Smork that Life and just put the charges well in our deck that dealt more damage. Yep, and uh, a quick matchup there with the control getting the win. This just goes to show aggro matchups are uh, usually quick no matter what the outcome, yep. because uh, the aggro decks just run out of steam really quickly. So an early first victory for RDU there with the Handlock. I just want to highlight how strong that line of play was from RDU on the previous turn. Um, because he does statistically leave himself slightly more likely to die because he dies to a lot of charge minions. Whereas before he was only dying to, you know, kill command, quick shot. I guess the odds are about the same, but the, the, the big important thing there is that that play sets up lethal, whereas the slower play with the Defender of Argus didn't. So by limiting the amount of turns, that's what led to the concede the following turn from 6-0. Otherwise, he's just increasing the amount of time his opponent has to draw his outs. Yeah, you talked about the being sad about the replacement of... Wolf Riders with Argent Horse Riders. I think Sixo probably joins you in being a little bit sad there. 
that Arjun Horse Rider was a wolf rider, it would have been a very different situation. As says he goes into the aggro druid. This is a this is an interesting one. This is a, a classic aggro versus handlock matchup again, but it's not necessarily a matchup we've seen as much. No, not a matchup that I have a great deal of experience with. I have played a, a lot of handlock, but not too much recently. Um, and I played only a little bit of this face druid deck when it first came out and it was a new deck and I just wanted to try it out and I didn't run into too much handlock at the time. So this is not a matchup I have too much experience with. Um, I feel like handlock is, is better to set up to deal with this sort of aggression than the sort of aggression that the regular druid has. Because um, the regular druid can do that thing where they just build a board and hold. And they do play things like big game hunter, which are absent from this list. Um, but double Lepanome opening with a solid curve and the Keeper of the Grove to deal with a potential early threat is a pretty good opening for 6 -0. Yeah, I mean, double Dark Bomb in the hand deals with uh, pretty much anything apart from a stealth minion. Yeah, hey, would you down. look at that? He has two stealth minions in his hand that line up really <laughs> nicely against those two Dark Bombs. Isn't that nice, Callum? That's, uh, that's a pretty good read from uh, RDU to, from 6 to draw those cards. <laughs> He's done well there. He's skillfully. He's a very a very strong player there, able to draw <laughs> the perfect cards to counter the dark bombs. The yeah, he's just gonna go with the Oh, he's gonna go with one in charge mode. Uh yeah, I, I think the consideration here is Hellfire. He knows his opponent still has the coin, so if he's to play the second minion in stealth, uh, then he'd lose this entire board to Hellfire, which of course he still does, but he's got two extra damage in at the same time by charging, so. Yeah, and he unveils the stealth minion as well, just to push for face. He survives that that one turn. That's generally what you see with cards like Worgen, Infiltrate, and Face Hunter as well, is you play them so they survive the, the first turn they're played and stick around to the next turn, and then you just attack with them normally. You don't generally keep them stealth for much more than that. For sure. And we saw, this is the, the second straight-up aggro deck that we've seen 6-0 playing against Hanlock. And we definitely saw in the last game, he pushed all in, made his opponent have the Molten Giant. So I'd be extremely surprised to see that strategy differ here. He's just going to use his silence to gain an insane amount of tempo on the board here. Interesting that he chooses to trade with his 2-1. Uh, I guess he doesn't want to just give the free Moltens this turn exactly. Um, but by, by not taking the damage right now, you do open yourself up. It's a very minor concern that you open yourself up to something like an IMB cow. But I guess he just didn't want to see the zero mana Moltens this turn. He wanted him to spend some sort of uh, mana on it if he did have them. But now he gets that perfect info that there are no Molten Giants in hand. So we are just going to plow on through as hard as we can with as much damage. Yep, yeah, doesn't go for the swipe and hero power. It can't swipe and hero power because it doesn't have enough mana. But could have put him to one if he was on six mana there but does still have the swipe in hand and uh well there's the molten giant but unfortunately that's not that's not gonna be enough the swipe is gonna be able to do it yep uh two damage on board with the leponome already but that's irrelevant because what we have is a weirdly very very strange looking charging druid as well he's gonna use instead playing the top deck card a little bit of mind games going on here wants to try and tilt rdu a little bit of course he did have lethal in his hand already but he played the top deck to try and get into rdu's head a little bit as, as he is regarded as a little bit of an emotional player all right so we've seen the two uh flex classes coming out from these two players both flex classes out of the game it's just druid and mage versus druid and mage now aggro druid versus and freeze mage versus each other aggro so this druid is going to be yeah this is yeah. going to be a test of the uh of the skill of the respective players you would argue that they've got to play but the exact same lineup Right, it doesn't take too much in-depth analysis to say who's favoured in this situation. The lineups are the same. So uh, honestly, like if anything, the person who's getting to choose, dictate the order of the matchups is a little bit favoured. Um, getting to pick which order to play things in, but there really isn't much choice to be had here. And you're going to have to play the face druid against the freeze mage. Oh man, I hope we get to see a, a, a freeze mage mirror match. I'm a, I, I love that matchup, just because it's po possibly the only matchup in the game where both players have about half of their deck, which is completely useless. Yeah, it's one of the most ridiculous things as a caster to cast, because you're talking about things like Flame Strike on an empty board. Those, those are the things that happen in that matchup. So generally a very uh, low intensity, low tempo matchup. Not a lot, lot happens for a very long period of time, and people are just trying to get cards out of their hand. But that perhaps comes later. What we have right now is the Aggro Druid against Freeze Mage. We can see the Cone of Cold from RDU, which is probably anti-Paladin tech. It's a, a card that I would definitely consider fairly strong in Freeze Mage right now. It's one. There's one of the, about the four cards that fit in about two spots in Freeze Mage that rotate in and out. Things like Explosive Sheep, Cone of Cold, uh, Loot Hoarder, Antique Heal Bot, 
second flame strike even sometimes right cone of cold is is pretty strong and it's it's pretty strong in some of the, th the things in this deck like the leper gnomes and the uh the druid of the sabers yeah absolutely freeze mage one of the classes that doesn't mind or one of the decks sorry that doesn't mind too much using their hero power on turn two they often don't have too much to do if they miss on their mad scientist um, so, reasonable opening, but he's going to have to make the uh, decision here as to whether he wants to use the Frostbolt uh, to deny the mana here, or whether he just develops the Acolyte and tries to get some card draw going. The the risk with developing the Acolyte, of course, is that you give your opponent a perfectly on-curve Keeper of the Bro. But then I guess your Doomsayer is protected on a later turn if the Keeper is forced out. What do you think of not going for the early Fell Reaver here? Uh, I mean, you're playing against the best deck in the game at neutralizing Fell Reaver, except maybe mid-range Paladin with with Outdoor Peacekeeper. Freeze Mage, the clue is in the name. They can freeze Fell Reaver for multiple turns. Ice Lance, Blizzard, Frost Nova, Cone of Cold. We saw even. Um, so if you get a Fell Reaver down too early, to you do? might just find what that you're left do? playing the game precisely with those four other cards that you have left in your hand. Yeah, it's it's always a risk to play Fell Reaver against Freeze Mage. I don't know if that's why I maybe maybe I would favor playing it early, just because you put your opponent on less chances to have those burn those free spells to burn your cards. Right. Uh, mm. And there's a there's a chance you might get one turn to swing with it. But there's also another school of thought that says that you really can't afford to play Fell Reaver against Freeze Mage. Well, really I, ever. I basically have the ultimate mentality, whereas like, yeah, I will play it because I think you need do need the pressure at some point of the AA that you have in your deck. Um, but you want to first be secure that the rest of your hand can win the game. You know, you want to have some combo pieces in your hand. Um, he does have Dr. Boom already, which is nice, but you want to make sure you have, like, enough gas going. Um, 6 -0 playing so quickly here, by the way, that his cards are yep. bugging out. This is something that happens if you play your top deck card too quickly. Um, so 6 -0 definitely uh, not thinking through too many of these turns that hard, but there we go. Fix itself. Keeper of the Grove comes down onto board to uh, it's funny hang out with his buddies. It's a mechanic that uh, exists in the game of Hearthstone from the tutorial where the giant bear in the, the yes. fight against Mukla yeah, goes up on the right-hand side. And that's why it's, there's there's some sort of bug in the spectator code where the Keeper of the Grove does that. But that, that movement of being giant on the right-hand side does exist in the game. It's just never actually used outside of the tutorial. So one of a number of mechanics in Hearthstone that are in the tutorial but are never actually replicated, like when Cho uh, levitates and you can't attack him. Mm. That's another one, yeah. Things they played about within the tutorial but never actually put in the game. Fascinating stuff as always, Callum. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Sol. What is also fascinating is Innovate Dr. Boom. There's a play that no one ever gets sick of seeing, right? <laughs> I didn't think I needed to talk about the game because uh, there was an Innovate Dr. Boom. That was just, that was going to happen. All right, I buy it. Seems legit. Um, so... RDU does have freeze options available to him here. Uh, he's going to end up taking a little bit of damage from the from the boom box, but this is where having a 0-7 silenced uh, Doomsayer on the board can sometimes work in your favor. Soak up some of this boom bot damage. Uh, he doesn't have the flame strike to follow this up, though, which is what he'd like to see in the perfect world. Um, but honestly, I don't, I don't see any other line here. Um, because of the positioning, he can't get Cone of Cold to freeze two really high-value targets, so I think he... That looks like he's going to... No, yeah, it's going to be the Blizzard. So yeah. yeah, he considered his options pretty deeply that turn, and the Doomsayer does, in fact, soak up the full amount of damage, which would have been six to his face that turn if it wasn't in play. Yeah, that's a uh, perfect secondary use for Doomsayer in this matchup, is being able to hit the Boombots and kill them off and then have the Doomsayer soak up that damage. Which can right. make all the difference as you're getting closer to uh, the turns where you need to play your Ice Block and be considering when your opponent's going to pop them. Right, it's a minor mechanical mistake that some players do make where they, ha they have uh, a silence effect in their hand when their board is frozen from Frost Nova and the Doomsayer is down and they just reflex silence the Doomsayer. Whereas a lot of the time you can just silence one of your own minions and just kill it, which is just strictly better. Um, so there's a minor mechanical error that some people make and that's the sort of situation why that is always the better idea. Um, we see a slight player in Cone of Cold here from Sixo, which is uh, pretty heads up, playing the Fell Reaver on the far left, so that if Cone of Cold does come down, you can't freeze the Doctor Boom and the Fell Reaver at the same time. Correct. Uh, any arena players in chat, anyone who's watched any uh, high-level arena player, Ratsmersh, Eddie Bunny, any of those guys, they will have had this drilled into their head. Cone of Cold is a thing that you do mm. realistically play around every game against Mage in Arena. So I think you put you 
definitely do play around it against Freeze Mage uh, at this point, just because Paladin is so strong. It's yeah, likely sure. to be a tech card. For sure. There's definitely been periods of the meta where some players could have come in and just never experienced Cone of Cold in Freeze Mage, so it might not be in their mind. But I think currently, yeah, it would make a lot of sense for Cone of Cold to be a card in the, in the Freeze Mage deck. This is Innervate, Druid of the Claw. Knife Juggler. Mm. Oh, both Druid of the Claws going, and a Shredder. That was some decent cards lost, unfortunately, on that uh, the Fell Reaver, but what does he do this turn? Doesn't have a Silence available to activate any of his minions. Can play a second Fell Reaver, that's a thing. Yeah, at that point you're kissing goodbye to your deck and you're just saying that you're going to go all in on these two 8-8s that you have on the board. Um, but yeah, I kind of favor just playing the other minions. I don't know if he's going to value the hero power here just to change the numbers that the mage is able to do with things like Flame Strike. Um, seems like a reasonable idea just to take down the 2 1 here, reduce the value of potential trades. This is still a huge board that needs answering. His deck is disappearing very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, he, he doesn't need the rest of his deck right now if he's able to get this board to stick, if the mage doesn't have the right answers. Yep, no freeze in the hand for RDU, and crucially as well, RDU needs a turn to play something like Thorison. He needs to be looking at playing Alex Straza pretty soon, also wants to weave in a Pyroblast at some point, so RDU does need to stop mm. just freezing the board at some point and move on to trying to burn out his opponent, and the presence of the Fel Reaver really stops him being able to do that. Also the presence of this Shade, which is going to keep growing uh, if things like Flame Strike don't come down. It's actually going to be a pretty scary board going on here interesting he's just gonna go for the cycle and activate his ice block here i'm not sure how many cards are left in 6-0's deck but he's probably getting very very low at this point uh, he hasn't had the almost out of cards alert yet so he does at least have a couple of options yet three three all right awesome um so he's one burn away from being having an empty deck so he's probably yeah i mean this is his hand this yeah is, this, this is, is it for has. the game this is what he has to win the game um he can do the necessary damage this turn to prop the ice block um, and Alex Straza the next turn for, for RDU is going to be too slow. Um, so he might have actually just found a way to, as we said, you know, you don't need the rest of your deck if you have an 8-8 on board that your opponent can't deal with. Um, so he may have just found a way to seal through. And Lothib, is, of course, is huge. Locks out something like Second Ice Block. Uh, locks out a Flame Strike. Locks out a Blizzard. Uh, the only reasonable answer here is something like Frost Nova. Um, but even then, he's just going to get hero powered in the face and it would still be lethal. So this Lothab is pretty much checkmate at this point. Yeah, it definitely is. This is uh, a really, really bad spot for the Freeze Mage. Even though 10 cards have been lost, uh, he's 10 cards deeper into his deck than the Freeze Mage. You see the rest of the deck. Ooh, that's almost a Doomsayer, but even the Doomsayer would have been irrelevant because hero power face still gets the job done. Yep, so that's going to be it. Six is going to take this and go up two to one. He's going to play out the rest of his deck, I think, just to... Oh, doesn't play the second Fell Reaver. Doesn't want to play everything. Yeah. Wild Pyromancer is such a tease, though, when you go for that Shredder drop. It's like, okay, I guess I need Doomsayer off Shredder, and then you get the thing. It's red, it's fiery, is it Doomsayer? No, it's Wild Pyromancer. God damn it. Yeah, so we're going to see an Aggro Druid mirror match in game number four. And this, this feels like the deciding game of the series, potentially. Uh, yeah, for sure, because if if um, RDU is able to win the Aggro Druid Mirror here, then he gets to run that matchup we just saw back the other way, which looked pretty damn one-sided from where we were sat. So. Yeah, it just looked like the, the number of threats in the Aggro Druid, because they weren't easily cleared by things like Blizzard and Flame Strike, meant that they stuck around for long enough that RDU just was never able to switch from the Freeze to the Burn phase in the Freeze Mage. Absolutely, and that is a solid looking start uh, at the top there from RDU, but down the bottom, 6-0 has the Innovate options as well, so they both have uh, reasonable early game hands. Um, RDU does have the, the smoother curve, but 6-0 um, yeah. has the ability to accelerate things out using the, the mana acceleration of Innovate. So. And Darnassus Aspirant now comes into hand and, and helps out a lot. Now he has multiple ways of playing out this curve in his hand. He can coin out Darnassus Aspirant, force his opponent to uh, find some way of, of taking down the Aspirant by using his hero power and missing a turn, or else he threatens to use the Shade the turn after. Um, or, yeah, it looks like he's going to favor the option that I was just about to mention, which is... I don't know, he's going to innovate out the hero power to clear out the Lepanone. Interesting. I was going to say he can go all the way straight through to uh, Pilot Shredder and then just follow it up with the Aspirant the next turn, but he's using his Innovate as a Moonfire here just to snipe down the Lepanome and uh, take full control of the board, basically guaranteeing 
that this Aspirant uh, sticks, because actually one of the cards this Aggro Druid cuts is Wrath. Yeah, that's really, really important. It means that you don't have those early removal options, and using your Innervate as Moonfire becomes much more of an option because it's the only re way you have to deal with those early minions. And I, I like this line from Sixo because he has a bit of a slower hand. What? He's going into Shade and Pilot and Shredder, but he doesn't have the, the board flood of like double Epernome, double Druid of the Saber, or anything like that sure. uh, to be able to really challenge his opponent's minions. I think he's he, it was a good option to clear and take board tempo there and, and take control of the board. And there's really not that many good options other than he can go with the Darnassus back here from RDU. But then he's just kind of seeding the tempo a little bit. Yeah, he can play his own Aspirant, which kind of creates the board tension, whereas Knife Juggler sort of just creates the even trade on the board. Um, what this does is it puts the ball back in Sixo's court. He basically gets to dictate how this game is going to proceed. Um, basically, he gets to choose this turn whether these players are going to trade hero powers over the next couple of turns. Um, just, you know, 2-3 into 2-3 hero power it down, or whether they're just going to try and race each other and see who has the, the stronger curve and see who has the most uh, aggression and the biggest power spike going into the mid-game. And no surprise, 6-0, known to be a very, very aggressive player. RDU, from, from his side, is as well. So no surprise to see both of these players just favouring the option of just developing the best they can do each turn and just seeing if they can make their opponent blink first. Yeah, so Keeper of the Grove coming into hand hmm. for RDU might see a silence on the Darnassus Aspirant. That's a play we've seen on his own Aspirant, a play we've seen a couple of times in this tournament. But uh, it would help him get into the Druid of the Claw next turn, guaranteed. It would, for sure. Um, don't know how much he's going to value that. He does have more options on the following turn if he wants to. Uh, he could also just trade and use the Keeper to snipe down his opponent's Aspirant, which, um, you know, it's, it's a similar effect. It's a different effect over the long term, but you're basically consolidating your own Mana Crystal versus um, ruining your opponent's Mana Crystal uh, on this turn. So it's, it's kind of a similar effect in terms of net mana gain. Um, he also has the option to just Hero Power down the 2-1 and play a Knife Juggler, which seems perfectly reasonable as well. Yep, long and hard think for RDU here. It does just go with the Knife Juggler. And he's going to trade off the uh, hit, kill off the Aspirant on Sixo's side. So demanding the shade gets uh, revealed here to do any damage. Clear out any of these minions. Clear out the knife juggler. And there's no good three drop for Sixo. Having that Aspirant taken out really disrupts his curve. He was looking to go sh into the Shredder next turn. Absolutely. And it does create a sort of situation where it's, it's a pretty nice board state. Because if you were to take the value trade with the shade into the Aspirant, obviously the remaining minion is a knife juggler. Um... So leaving your dude around at 1 HP is no guarantee that it's going to get any further value on the board. Uh, interesting that he chooses just to go for the hero power there, and I imagine that means he's going to keep this shade in stealth, which is not something that you tend to do for long periods of time with this deck. The deck's so aggressive that you kind of just value getting the attack in when you can with the shade, because you're likely to have other minions on the board alongside it, so you're presenting multiple threats all the time. Um, but he has just seeded a little bit of tempo back to, um, to RDU. And like I said earlier, these players have both been trying to make the other one blink for the first couple of turns, and then they both blinked. They both took that turn where they slowed down and used the hero power just to control the options of the opponent a little bit. And 6-0 opts to reveal the shade this turn, which uh, is quite more common in the aggro druid than it is in a standard druid, but it means that either of these minions can trade up with it. But again, you're then demanding that RDU stops the aggression from his side, so you're effectively creating with the Shade something of a, a taunt minion this turn, because if you don't clear it now, you're going to have to use something like Swipe or Keeper of the Grove to deal with it later on. Or you have a, a really good trade with it here. Yeah, this is exactly what I said last turn, where normally in this deck you will be attacking with your Shade, because you're normally able to just develop a, a significant amount of pressure alongside it. So he has the Pilot Shredder on the board here. There's now two high-priority targets that need to be removed off the board, two very threatening high-damage targets. Uh, so he feels fine with revealing the Shade, getting the four damage in, and this deck is just, just so aggressive that you can back up even that four damage. Um, you know, getting four damage from one card with this deck is plenty, because you have so much more auxiliary damage to finish it up. All right, is it going to be a Fell Reaver here? Yeah, I like the Fell Reaver a lot. Worst case scenario, it gets to trade down this entire board, takes both minions with it. Um, if your opponent feels like he can't race it, but RDU might feel like he can race this thing out. He has the Keeper to silence the uh, Piloted Shredder, so he might just decide to make that the priority target for removal right now and just decide to race the Fell Reaver with his uh, significantly sized board of his own, considering he can play the Druid of the Saber alongside it as well. Yeah, he can burn six cards here. He could burn eight if he really wanted to, but I think he'll probably just stick with the, the six. 
I like the idea of, of clearing off the Shredder here and just leaving the Fell Reaver with the taunt up because the Fell Reaver can't, isn't really looking to trade, right? Fell Reaver wants to go to face. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're going to spend too long trading with a Fell Reaver, mm. then you're going to run out of cards. The, it's an AA with a very, very volatile effect, and the volatility of that card just naturally leads it to being insanely aggressive. You kind of have to hit face with it. Um, but yeah, I believe RDU will just... Um, yeah, send out his signal, very, very clear signal that he is activating the race this turn. And he might even be so aggressive here that he values the two damage of the Keeper higher than the Silence. Yup. Yeah, that's what's going to be Moonfire to the Dome. Yup. And we see a Keeper getting burned on the other side for six, so that's pretty significant because it means he can't silence the Taunt this turn. Savage Roar getting burned was huge as well because we see Force of Nature and Innovate in 6-0's hand, so he can yep. potentially combo next turn if he's able to stay alive for one turn. Are we going to see uh, Innovated Force of Nature here with the Knife Juggler, maybe? Uh, it's a, definitely a play you can make with this deck. It's one of the few things in the deck that synergizes really well with Knife Juggler. There's Living Roots, which is the first, and of course Nature being the second. Otherwise, it's just there as an aggressive minion that does a lot of damage. Um, yeah, so Force of Nature is a potentially really, really swingy turn here. All right, let's see if he can hit twice on this Shade. He does. That's pretty crucial, I think. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, he would have rather hit twice on the Panther because he was guaranteed to be able to take out the Shade anyway. Um, whereas if he'd have hit two knives on the panther, then he gets the full board clear, consolidates this huge board, um, and you know removes all the damage from his opponent. Here, you know he's still under threat of lethal. All right, here's a uh, here's a temptation here from RDU. The, the swipe is looking pretty nice on the fell reaver and the pilot shredder kill, but then there's also a doctor boom on turn seven. What to do? Yeah, he's staring at fifteen right now though. If he does play the boom. He can innovate a hero power to make his opponent need five instead of four, but that's not relevant because all the four damage cards that Druid play, Druid of the Claw, Swipe, um, 6 would be able to weave in his hero power with them. Um, so I don't think, um, as aggressive as he was last turn, I don't think you can realistically, playing the odds, um, expect to not expect not to die in most situations next turn because four is just such an easy number for this deck to do because of cards like Swipe, because of cards like Druid of the Claw. All right, it looks like he is going to go for the Doctor Boom here and take the risky play. Hope that there isn't damage coming in from 6-0. <laughs> wow, all right. Thanks for the aggression. All right, let's see boys. it. So he's going to have to trade. Yeah, okay. so if you're making the Boom plays, you most definitely have to trade on the board just to reduce. And there we, there we go. He would have, in fact, top deck swipe if he'd have been insanely greedy that turn. Um, so I definitely like the play to trade. And uh, now the ball is back in 6-0's court. How aggressive does he want to be this turn? Obviously, he has to deny damage because this board is directly threatening lethal. Nine on board plus the hero power is the 10 that he has. So, <sighs> so rough here. You can, you can trade the 8-4 into the 7-7, seven, seven, or you can swing to 8 for face and then use the pilot shredder and the swipe to kill the boom. But then you risk putting yourself in lethal from a uh, boom bot range. Very so true. Please, Leopard. Well, let's yeah. see actually if the Leopard can do lethal here. We saw this at the GigaCon tournament. Oh. Okay, that's lethal. <laughs> that is actually lethal. Exactly for wow. the Leopard on Boombot play. That's nice. a, that is the second tournament I've seen that, and I spotted it this time. I didn't spot it the last time. Last time I didn't call it before it happened. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll put it out there. I didn't know I wasn't looking at that at all. I was confused about why he was swiping before he attacked with Fell Reaver, because of course there was a potential for it to die. I was not looking at the Leopard on lethal at all. It made sense to play it first, obviously just because the two damage was good. Um, but yeah, I just wasn't looking at the lethal numbers at all. I'll hold my hands up there. So good shout, Callum. And I'll, I'll fully admit that I only saw it because I missed that about right. three weeks ago at another tournament. <laughs> yeah. The exact same play. Yeah. Um, Boombots hitting the uh, hitting the Lepronome. All right. Well, Sixo is going to advance their semifinals. He's going to play Zelay in the first semifinal. Uh, Archon versus former Archon. Maybe a bit of a grudge match for Sixo against his old teammate. That's going to be an interesting one. Uh, we're going to have our next quarterfinal coming up in a few minutes. We're going to go to a, a break now just while we uh, figure out what we're doing with our next match coming up. Don't go anywhere. You're watching the HS Arena Invitational. <laughs> 